So I've started to build my crank slider. I've activated the contact solver and you can see that it seems like it's working pretty well. The block is not sliding through ground and then all of a sudden it's over here somewhere, right? This is kind of weird. Let's talk about it. So let's talk about sliding joints, pin and slot joints, and Autodesk Inventor's contact solver so you know what it can do and what it can't do. So backing up a bit, to get to this point, I first drew four different parts, my ground, two links, and this block. Saved them all as separate part files. Then up here at the top left, I created a new assembly file, and then using the place command, I was able to navigate to my folder, find each of my parts, hit open, right? And I can add it just by left clicking. I can create as many copies as I want and then hit escape when I'm done. And now I have a whole bunch of extra cranks in my drawing, which now I'm just gonna left click on and press the delete key on my keyboard because I don't need that many. To assemble this crank rocker, I'm gonna start off with the crank first, then the coupler, and then add the block. So in order to attach the crank to ground, I'm gonna first apply a constraint. I'm gonna use this mate constraint with the solution being the two opposing surfaces so I can first align the front surface of ground and I'll rotate my view to the bottom side of the crank. And as soon as I left click there, it jumps over and I lose sight of it. And you can see now that it's sort of snapped into place. I'll hit the apply button and then cancel to close this window. And then I'll create the actual joint, which is going to align the hole to the pin here on ground. So after left clicking on joint, I come up to the type of joint I want, which is gonna be rotational. I'll do a first left click on the center of the hole, and then a second left click on the center of the pin. You'll see a 360 degree animation as the crank starts to rotate around. I'll hit apply and then cancel to close that window and zoom out a little bit. And I can now left click and move my crank around. And I'm gonna repeat this sequence one more time to attach the coupler to the crank. I'm first gonna apply a mate constraint where I align the front surface of the crank to the back surface of the coupler. Hit apply and then cancel. And then I'll open the joint window, select a rotational joint, select the center of the hole, and then I do a second click at the center of the pin. And again, you should see a short animation as it rotates around. I'll hit apply and then cancel to close the window. And I can zoom out and see that now I've got my pin and coupler kind of both attached to each other. If you wanna see a much more detailed video about rotational joints and cylindrical joints, click here up on your screen and I've got a full walkthrough from how to draw parts, how to create an assembly file and how to connect them all via pin and cylindrical joints. But this video is mainly gonna be about the slider. So the next thing we'll look at will be the block. So I'm gonna start off again with some constraints. Again, using this mate constraint with about, which is about surfaces, I'm gonna start off by doing a flush constraint and say that I want my slider, the front side of my slider, to line up with the front side of ground. I'll hit apply and cancel just to close that window to show you what happened there. Now the block is aligned with the front edge, but of course I can still move it kind of anywhere in two dimensional space. I'll open up the constraint window one more time and this time add still a mate constraint, but now in the mate direction because I want the top surface of ground to align with the bottom surface of the slider. I'll hit apply and cancel again. And then now you can see that the slider is now restricted to only moving in one dimension, only along the direction of the ground. But one thing I haven't done yet is activate collisions because here you can see that the slider will actually pass completely through ground, right? By default, Autodesk Inventor does not account for collisions. And usually that's fine. Most of the time your part is gonna be designed so that things don't collide. Or maybe you just want to model something kind of quickly and you don't care if they collide or not. But if I do care about collisions, then the setting you're gonna look for is contact set. So if I right click on the block and scroll down, you'll see an option called contact set. I'll click that and if I right click one more time, you can see that now there's a check mark next to it. I'm gonna do that one more time for ground. I right click on ground, come down and check contact set. 
And so far, nothing has happened just from checking that box. The objects still are gonna pass right through each other. It's not until I tell Inventor that I wanted to do something about it that it starts actually accounting for those contact sets. Under the Inspect tab of the ribbon, you'll see this button here, Activate Contact Solver. So if I left click Activate Contact Solver, you'll see it's now highlighted in blue. And now if I take the orange block, again, I'm just left clicking on it and moving it around. If I get it close to the wall, you'll see that now I'm moving my cursor a little bit and it's not able to pass through. As I move my cursor, you'll see that it's stuck. It's gonna get close to the wall, it'll be right up against it, but it will not actually pass through. However, what Inventor is actually doing is not preventing solid objects from passing through each other. It's only preventing them from occupying the same space. So if I actually move my cursor all the way past the wall, you'll see that the block jumps through time and space right all the way to the other side. So if contact sets are important to your design, you really need to account for this. And what you'll find is that the smaller your parts are, the easier it's gonna be for you to, to violate this contact solver and to jump across something, which if you're not expecting it, can lead you to very misleading results. So just be careful and understand what the limitations are. So now to finish this crank solver, we need to add one more pin joint. So I'm going back to the assemble part of the ribbon. I'll hit the joint button. And again, I'm gonna scroll down and make this a rotational joint, which I use for pins. I'll zoom in a little bit so I can click on the center of the hole on the coupler and then zoom in again so I click on the center of the pin on the block. Now I'm going to see a quick rotation here. I'll hit the apply button to set that and then cancel to close the window. Over here I hit the magnifying glass to zoom out so I can see the whole object. And now I left click on my crank and I can kind of manually rotate this. And now I have a completed working crank slider. So this is a pretty basic example. The next one's gonna be way more complex with curved surfaces, slot joints, and all kinds of other stuff. But it all starts off by creating a new assembly file. And from there, I can open place in order to place my parts, navigate to the folder where your parts are found, and you can just click and open to insert each of them one piece at a time. So again, place, then I'll just select my next part, hit open, and just do one click and then hit the escape button because I only want one of each piece. So that's how to start an assembly. Just get all of your pieces in there and you'll worry about connecting them afterwards. Now I have a setting activated so that as soon as I place my first object, it automatically gets grounded. But if you don't have that activated in Inventor, double check that when you right click on your ground, that this option called grounded is actually checked. You need a check mark next to ground because you want something to be stationary and fixed. I'll start off by just placing some of the pin joints real quick, since again, I already covered that in a previous video. I start off by making mate constraints, where I want the top surface of ground to match up to the bottom surface of the pin. And I'll hit apply. I'll do that one more time. Top surface of ground to match up to the bottom surface of the other link. Hit apply and cancel that window. I'll now create joints where I'm gonna create a rotational joint from the center of the hole of this piece to the center of the pin. I'll watch that piece rotate around, make sure it looks good. Hit apply. So I'll cancel that window. I'll open up to create a new joint. I'll scroll down to rotational. I select the center of this hole and then left click the center of this pin. I can watch that link rotate around, hit apply and cancel to close that window. And now I can left click and show that I have two working links. I'll connect the blue triangle to each of those red links by first constraining the plane, like the elevation where I want it to be, by saying that I want the top surface of those links to be on the same level as the bottom surface of the triangle. Again, apply and then cancel to close that window. And again, each time I'm rotating the view, I'm just clicking on the view cube over here on the top right, or sometimes this magnifying glass, which sort of zooms in to make the drawing basically fit the screen. I'm gonna rotate now to look at it from the bottom because now when I create this joint, I wanna create a rotational joint 
where I'm going to have the, where I'm going to click on the center of the red hole and match that up to the center of this blue triangle. You'll see it rotates around. It looks like it broke the first joint, but as soon as I hit apply and cancel, I can zoom out a little bit and you can see that uh, it's still actually connected. I'll do that one more time. Create another rotational joint. I'm going to click on the center of the hole and then use the middle mouse button to pan over here a little bit and click on the center of this pin. You know, see an animation as it rotates around. Hit apply cancel to close that window. And let's try to rotate the view so we can actually see what's going on here. So now the blue triangle is connected to both of the red links. We've got one more pin joint for this green wheel, which is going to attach right here on ground. So I'll first create a constraint, again a mate constraint, where I'm going to say that I want the top surface of ground to be against the bottom surface of the wheel. Hit apply and cancel to close that window and then create a joint of type rotational. And I'll zoom in and click on the center of the hole and then the center of the top of the pin. The wheel moves into place and it's spinning around even though you can't really tell because it's just a wheel. Hit apply and cancel and zoom back out and it now looks like it's in place. This next thing to line up is gonna be the purple block which is actually gonna be a slider and is gonna slide around this round surface on ground. So Inventor does not limit slider joints to only being flat surfaces. Slider joints can also work on circular surfaces. So I drew the outer radius of this ground to match the inner radius of this purple block. And if I kind of move them to be next to each other, you can see that the radius for them is gonna match. So that as it rotates around, it's actually gonna be directly connected to it the whole time. So slider joints can be set up as joints, but I find them easiest to just do constraints. So I'm gonna do again a constraint type mate and solution first, I'll do a flush solution, which is gonna show that I want the top surface of the block to be aligned with the top surface of ground. So that's just a single left click on both of those, apply and cancel to close that window. And you can see that now it is lined up with the top surface, although again, I can still move it freely in two dimensional space. Now to align it to actually move along the curved surface, I'll do one more constraint, still type mate, this time the opposing direction, the mate solution type. I'm gonna zoom in and click on this inner round surface. And then I'll do rotate my view a little bit and make my second click on this round surface. And as soon as I make that second click, it snaps into place. I will hit apply and cancel. And as I zoom out, you can now see that this purple block is now rotating along that curved surface. So it is a slider that's moving along a curved surface, not just a flat ramp. So the hole in the purple block is intended to fit the pin on the orange semicircle. So we'll go ahead and do a rotational joint for that now. So I'll first do a constraint, an opposing direction, because I want the top surface of this orange piece to line up underneath. So I click on the bottom surface of the purple and that adjusts the height of the orange piece. So apply and cancel to close that window. I'm gonna drag to move this so that the pieces are kind of closer to each other to make it easier to click on on the next step. Open up the joint, select my rotational joint, and then now I can do a left click on the hole and then a left click on the pin. You'll see it rotate. It looks like it broke the slider joint, but as soon as I hit apply and then cancel, the slider joint snaps back into place. And as I zoom out so you can see, Right, the slider joint still works and the orange piece kind of moves along with it. So the next joint that I'll do is I'll say that I want this orange piece to remain tangent to the wheel so that instead of being dragged upwards, it's really only gonna be rotating a little bit. So I'm gonna set that up with a constraint. So far, every type of constraint I've used has been type mate, but if I move over two squares here, you see a tangent constraint. This is what you use when you have a round surface, either bordering another round surface or a flat surface. So if I click on tangent, there are two options here and it looks like the second one is the one I want where, where they are on the outside of each other. But I have noticed that sometimes these give unexpected results. So if you try one of these and it you don't get what you expect, just try the other one. So what I'm gonna need to do is to click on the two surfaces that I wanna be in contact. So I'm gonna first do a left click on this round surface 
on the orange piece. And then I'm going to zoom out a little bit and do a left click on the edge of the wheel. And as soon as I do that, I hear a snapping sound and it moves into place and you can see that they are met along a tangent. So I hit apply and then cancel. And as I rotate the view a little bit, you can see now that as I rotate the orange piece, it tries to stay stuck to the wheel. And if you rotate too far, you can get some kind of unexpected results where it actually seems to kind of separate from the wheel. What's actually happening if I rotate my view, if you envision this round surface as being a complete circle, the extension of that circle would still be tangent to the wheel. So Inventor will actually project surfaces beyond the actual surface itself. So this tangent constraint does not restrict the two to actually always be touching. It only makes it so that the curves, even when you extend them past the part, would still be touching. So again, something to just kind of keep an eye out for and it helps to understand what's happening because you will inevitably draw things like this where you get really odd results and sometimes it helps to know why that's happening. Last piece to finish is gonna be to connect the pin on the back side of this blue triangle into the slot on my orange semicircle. So I'll first rotate my drawing around to the back so we can actually see the pin here on the back of this blue triangle. And when deciding whether to use a joint or a constraint, you could open up the joint and look around and you can see that, you know, a slider joint might work for this. But instead, you can do this again with a constraint and you can do it again with just a tangent constraint because you have a round surface on the edge of this pin, which I can click on once. And then I'll zoom in here and click on this flat surface on the side of the orange piece. And as soon as I do that, you hear a snapping noise as the blue piece jumps into location. I'll hit apply and cancel. And now as I zoom out, you can see that I can actually do a little bit of motion here. So as I move the purple block, you can see that the orange semicircle stays tangent to the green wheel and the blue triangle slides back and forth inside that slot on the orange semicircle. Now, one thing I have not activated though is contact set. So if I move my purple surface further, you can see that the blue triangle will actually extend past the edge of the orange semicircle. So if I want to try to prevent that, that's where I'll go back and activate a contact set. So I will right click on the blue triangle, scroll down to contact set, and same thing on the orange. I will right click, scroll down to contact set, and left click. As I look back again, you can see that now there's a check mark, and on the triangle, check mark. When I come up here to the inspect tab on the ribbon and left click on activate contact solver so that now it's highlighted in blue. So now as I move the purple slider, when I get to the edge, it offers some resistance. I can now try to move it past and the system is going to be stuck. But of course, at the very beginning, I showed that the contact solver only prevents objects from overlapping. It doesn't prevent you from warping past the edge. So if I actually do a larger cursor movement with my mouse, you can see I actually completely break the piece. Right, the blue triangle jumped all the way past. Right, as I try to move it back in, it won't overlap the pin, but if I try to jump it all the way past, it will jump back into the hole. So repeating again, the contact solver, it's nice for small motions. If you only try to go a little bit past the edge, the contact solver will stop you. But if you try to go way past the edge, your part's just gonna break. Things are gonna jump completely out of where they belong. And then you might have kind of a mess to try to get your piece back to fit together again. And then you can go back to the, the regular expected motion. Thank you. I really do appreciate you watching this video. Your time is valuable. And I hope that you found this a worthy use of your time. Thanks for watching and enjoy the rest of your day.